Hello, welcome to our semiconductor education program. This is Vincent Chan. Today we are going to learn a new lesson on the frequency compensation. So it's called Miller compensation. Stability and the Miller compensation, part one. Why this matters? Why Miller compensation matters? So before we dive into, before we introduce the Miller compensation, let's quickly go through what we learned from the previous uh, lesson, which is on the pole splitting. One of the, the, the very popular compensation techniques is called pole shifting compensation. And uh, let's start with an uncompensated amplifier, which is composed of three high frequency poles is located which are located at 100 kilohertz 1 megahertz and 10 megahertz so 1 2 and 3 fhp1 fhp2 and fhp3 so let's assume the fhp1 the original dominant pole frequency is decided, is determined by this time constant. So think about this, just imagine, just think about this, picture this in your mind. This is an operational amplifier, a multi-stage amplifier. A multi-stage amplifier. The so first stage and the second stage, and maybe there's a third stage. And the original dominant pole for the uncompensated Multi-stage amplifier is determined at the interface between the first stage and the second stage. And the total resistance at that interface, just look at the slide, is called RT. And the total capacitance at that interface is denoted as CT. So the dominant pole frequency should be the inverse of the time constant. So one over two pi RT CT. So now we're going to do a compensate. We want to com compensate this, but instead of doing the externally surgery, externally connected compensation network, we're doing kind of the internal surgery. Well, during the process, we want to mount, we want to implement, implement a compensating capacitor. And where? At the interface between the first stage and the second stage. So if we do that, then we increase the time constant, right? The total time constant. So we reduce the pole frequency. So from the original higher frequency at FHP1 to what? To a new purple dominant pole. The new purple dominant pole called FHDP. FDP. So on the Frequency axis, here's the original, right? Located at 10 to the fifth power, 100 kilohertz. So now it's gonna move to a lower frequency because the time constant get bigger. So with this technique, you can precisely control the time constant at a certain, at a certain node. So you can precisely control push the original dominant pole, original uh, dominant pole to a new, to a much lower frequency, right? So why I said the much lower frequency? So compare these two. The original one is located at 100 kilohertz, right? To gain a 45 degree of phase margin, that's what we learned before. So the frequency, the FHP1 has to be reduced by how many times? Two decades, two decades, 100 times. Because this result shows the answer is one kilohertz, okay? So pay attention to the magnitude, the order of magnitude. So you have the uncompensated as a blue. So you have the compensated as a purple, okay? So what's the key point? Assuming this is the three-stage op -end. The uncompensated open loop gains comes from a three-stage up-end. And uh, for the uncompensated, 
The first pole frequency is decided by the R1 and C1. Okay? And the second pole frequency is decided by R2, C2. Now, where is the B? So B is basically this fits with our original assumption. So our original assumption is the FHP1. The original dominant of original first pole frequency is decided by the interface between the first stage and the second stage. So the B, the node B is located at the interface, right? Between the first differential and the second gain stage. So now, if we do this, the pole shifting, if we do the pole shifting, then the compensation capacitor is required to connect at the inter interface, to connect between the base and the ground, right? And uh, let me ask you this. The compensation capacitor, the value of the compensation capacitor is small or big? It depends how much you want to push the frequency lower, right? And I, I said the frequency is lower by 100 times. It's lower by two decades. It's from one kilohertz bring down. You have to bring the one kilohertz down to one kilohertz by 100 times. Right? And the new dominant pole frequency is going to follow this equation. The inverse of the total time constant. So the time constant equals the R1 times the C1 plus CC. In short, in summary, to bring the first pole frequency down by 100 times to down by two decades requires a very big capacitor. Usually it's in a microfarad range, in a range of microfarad. So can you put on a microfarad? So how big is the microfarad capacitor? Usually it's kind of like this. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like, like, like this. It's kind of like this, okay? But if the amplifier you want to compensate is the integrated circuit, then this kind of capacitor is too big to be implemented in an analog integrated circuit. It's just too big. In other words, Theoretically, this is doable. But practically speaking, if you want to do this in the integrated circuit, if you want to put a CC on chip, it's too big to be implemented. This is why this technique matters in the realm of the analog integrated circuit. In the realm of integrated circuit, analog integrated circuit. So this kind of reminds us of a effect, a capacitor's multiplication effect. So coming from Miller's theorem, instead of connecting the capacitor between base and the ground, we connect across the gain stage between the input and output across the feedback would build a bridge through the Miller multiplication effect. You don't have to implement a big number, a bulky capacitor. You can implement a tiny capacitor, but through the game, through the amplification, through the Miller, so-called Miller multiplication, it can still create an equivalently big 
capacitive effect. So this kind of compensation technique is doable, is visible in the analog integrated circuit design. And it's very, very important in the analog integrated circuit design. It's called Miller compensation, right? But as you can imagine, when we connect a feedback, when it involves the feedback, the transfer function is going to become complicated. So this is the lesson I'm going to teach you in the next one. So look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Thanks for watching.